All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Jamie Sala. I'm with Lyondale Bissell Global Projects Group. Uh, so as you can see, the topic here, creating the environment for success. Perfect segue from uh, the conversation we just had here about uh, you know, what can we do to build the right culture and team here. So I'll just kick it off with a, just a few brief thoughts from an owner's perspective. And then we've got our, our panel here. We've got uh, Rick from Brant Safeway, Mark Hexagon, and Nick from Insight AWP. They'll, they'll, they're the experts, they'll deep dive a little bit, and then we'll conclude it with the Q&A. Um, so again, um, let's see. Okay. Okay, so you're not gonna see anything here that's uh, surprising and this builds on a lot of themes. You see a lot of words here that uh, we've been talking about the, the past day, planning, communication, and alignment. Um, so from an owner's perspective, uh, for me, the key is is that it's it's the owner that has to set the tone. Uh, we refer we just referenced uh, Kevin's great talk yesterday, and really what resonated for that was it was a one team approach driven by the owner. So for me, uh, as we get into these three topics, planning the first step really an owner has to just look and say, what do we want to do? All right, at the earliest phases. So. And in this case, AWP, but this could be any strategy you want to implement and particularly any culture change that you're trying to drive. What do we want to do internally? And do we have the support, you know, throughout the, our organization to implement that? And again, great discussion just now. This isn't just project managers. This isn't just, you know, a, a VP. This is every discipline with, throughout. So for me, you know, the first step is the owner's team has to define what they want and, and be ready to implement. Um, Jay had a great uh, Research Team 390 talk yesterday. I encourage you to take a look at the phase timeline. But again, as, as we're on the owner's side at the earliest phases of the project, there's a few things we want to do in terms of AWP, path of construction, uh, defining your CWAs to kind of set the stage and to align yourself uh, I always say that if, if we don't know what we want and if we're not on the same page, how are we going to engage with, with other folks, contractors, vendors, et cetera? Uh, so again, can't underestimate that, that importance. And so then that, that kind of brings, uh, I'll use communication and alignment you know, together. Um, what, Waleed, I think uh, alignment, 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 I, I couldn't agree more. For me, uh, I've seen projects go well and not, and it's generally communication and alignment that, that are the keys to either success or failure. I, I think about, you know, we can look at this NASA video, but engineers can do anything. You know, there's just really not technical problems that, that sidetrack a project too significantly. You know, for me, it's, if you, or if any of you think about projects that went well or didn't, it's, you know, a splintered team or a team not operating under the one team approach or just mis misalignment on priorities or lack of communication. So again, I can't really emphasize enough how important um, those are. And again, from the owner's perspective, you have to drive that consistently. It's not at a kickoff meeting. It's not uh, through contract language. It's, it's the behaviors and the leadership that the owner's team and leadership uh, instills. So I like to, I, the term I, uh, we like to use is check your badge at the door. Now again, you know, there, there's contracts and the, there's other things, but uh, again, as we heard from Kevin, if you have a one team approach, if you're co-located, if you're meeting together, if you're really in the spirit of, of we're all in this together and the outcome's a win-win, not there's no win-lose, it's either win-win or, or lose-lose, uh, that's where I've seen great things happen on projects. Oh, so you can see this uh, kind of kind of silly little analogy here, the, the boats, but uh, it's kind of interesting to think about. Uh, take, the, take the two guys that are uh, you know, paddling away there against each other. You know, I think about it as they probably didn't have a conversation before they got in the boat. You know, it's called the boat execute. All right, they, they jumped in the boat, maybe they're in a rush and uh, clearly not much communication, clearly not much alignment, clearly not much planning and started paddling away. So they're probably going in circles and then fighting. Uh, 
We look at the other one, and you know, I like to think that uh, the owner there, with who's leading the way, has done some forethought. You know, thought about where, where am I going to go? What kind of team do I need? You know, how many people do I need on this team? Are these the right players? Maybe they're not the uh, strongest rowers, but maybe it's a team that works well together. And uh, you know, let's just say we're pretty confident that they can reach their destination. So. Let's say as an owner, you figured out essentially what you want to do. Um, now it is time to, oh, hold on. All right. <laughs> uh, got some slightly different slides, no problem. I was going to read them. Okay, so essentially um, assembling the right team. You know, we need parties that can work together. Again, I, I mean, Kevin, Kevin did the heavy lifting yesterday, you know, having conversations with people. Are you willing to? To work with us. I thought, uh, you know, one of the best lessons learned I jotted down from Kevin was uh, cooperation is more important than AWP experience, right? So we, we can all learn, but if you have people that are eager to learn versus, you know, kind of old, old dog, new tricks, you know, I'm, I'm not open to learning or, or this will never work, or this is just a trend and it'll go away. And those really aren't the type uh, that's going to get to us where we want to go. Uh, so. We've talked a lot here, you know, almost the theme in every, every presentation I've been a part of is, is the culture and the team alignment. Um, the research team, I think it was at uh, Fernando 405 with leveraging culture was a great one if, if you want to reference that. But uh, again, culture is so important, the alignment is so important, and, and the owner just has to, to drive that throughout the project. Uh, you do see um, a, a comment here about data, collecting and managing the right data. So, I like to think about uh, data the same way in terms of alignment, right? We talked yesterday a lot about uh, one source of the truth, uh, using contracts to kind of level set the data expectations, but uh, to have the right conversations, to make the right decisions, data is such an important part of it, and we'll, we'll be talking about that a little later. Okay. Okay, so I won't deep dive too much here, but uh, you know, how are some ways that we can build that environment for success? Um, you know, we, we've heard the term AWP champions, and, and again, and I'd say within an owner's organization, you do need that support upwards uh, to, to, you know, expend the cost up front that, that it might take or, or train folks or, or whatnot. Um, and then across your project team and, and contractor organizations, you know, we'd be looking for the same same folks that have the same mindset that, that really want to give it, give it a go. A uh, couple other things, vendor pre-qualification. Um, you know, how do we know that, that the vendors and the contractors we're sele selecting um, have the same approach to AWP that, that we like, or, or they're capable and qualified, or they'd work together with others. So there's a, um, probably someone in here wrote it, but uh, I've seen a vendor pre-qualification uh, guide for AWP, so it's got some pretty specific questions that you can use to, to tease out and have maybe the right conversations as you're, you're bringing folks on board. Um, and again, uh, ensuring that AWP is included in the contracting strategy, contracting documents, uh, and I'll lump in data requirements with that. So I call this part, part of the planning again, is, is getting your act together from an owner's side before you've gone out too far to, to engage folks. Um, documenting it, making sure the contract uh, is clearly communicates your expectations. And then with that, we've got kind of a level set playing field. Um, I like to say on, on the bigger a project gets, the less you can make it up as you go. So if an owner doesn't do this, and uh, I think Jay, you call it the pre-implementation phase, you're kind of making it up as you go. And that's generally a recipe for, for lack of alignment, surprises, et cetera, et cetera, that are all the things that can uh, kind of tank a project. So that's all for me. I think uh, Rick will be up next. Appreciate it, Jamie. Um, just I had to reflect a little bit from the day yesterday and then, and then the comments this morning. So last, last several years, I've been very focused on it, it's very hard for us as some of the lower level contractors to really be successful. And this last couple of years, we're seeing some of the pieces that would enable us to be successful starting to happen. 
the, the analogy that I, that I draw with my children at home when they were younger is every math problem is not a one-step math problem. So I think sometimes we think, hey, there's an easy button to do AWP. Where should we start? I'm going to buy some software. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I, I personally think the theme that I heard Jake talk about today and a couple of folks yesterday is the owner has to be engaged. The owner has to help own it for us. They're the captain of the ship, like Jamie just said. Once we start doing that, you're going to see a lot of synergy. You're going to see a lot of, you're going to see that maturity curve accelerate. We've kind of been, I don't want to touch on it in my slides, but I, I think it's just, it's worth mentioning that I don't think I have to, for Lloyd's benefit and others who've heard me kind of beat the drum about commercial strategy and contracting methodology. I think, I think that's now done. So I'm very excited to see. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little lighthearted approach at this. Um, I, I used to use this in the old days when I was an operations leader in the, in the, in the business. And it was around safety, but it really applies to, to, to AWP or anything. When you go to the store and you look at a dozen eggs, what sort of, what do you do? Um, how, do you, how do you look at those eggs? Do you, you open them? You inspect them? If one of the eggs is broken, what do you do with those eggs? Put them back. And so I, I want to draw the parallel to an AWP ecosystem or a project. If I'm an owner and I'm an ecosystem of providers on a project, we're all eggs in the carton and we all matter to the other eggs. So once we check them and they're good, then we're on our way. We can kind of start climbing that maturity curve. We can start taking the next steps. Is it data? Is it technology? Is it system? Is it contract? It's all of those things. Is it lean? Is it... PPM methodology, it's all of those things, but we have to have a common framework and a common way to deliver that ecosystem for the project's benefit. That's the card of the next. So we really depend on each other, even the low level soft craft provider, like the company that I work for. We're critical to the work if you think about it, but we haven't typically been included. We've We've started to become very important in that process, which means we're now one of the eggs in the carton. If our egg is broken, what happens to the rest of the eggs? Something's, something's not quite right. So we have to all play our role. So when you're a, when you're a project, how do, you, how do you typically look at your project? You think about it in terms of we're all in this together or I'm gonna start writing contracts to the mechanical, the equipment, the cranes, the specialty folks. If you're doing that, you think, I'm, I'm going to really take care of this project. I'm going to get the best rates. I'm going to do those typical kind of parochial things that we've always done. We can't continue to do that. That's not what this is. You heard alignment. You heard communication. If I'm writing contracts, what am I going to be focused on? And that's the way I'm managing my risk on a project. It's purely through a contract model. I'm going to optimize that contract as a contract, which is part of our fiduciary duty to our company and all, but, but we can do both. We can say, hey, if the contracts are aligned where our tails are tied together and everyone's success depends on the other folks' success, we can actually produce exceptional results. And some of the owners we work for have, have started to do that. It's quite, quite amazing. And, and you think, well, what, what, is he, what does he care? I just need to write contracts. But when you think about an ecosystem and we're all relying on engineering outputs, we're relying on project control data, everyone's methodologies might be different. And if I'm, if I'm a lower level sub or an EPC or a GC, I'm managing six or eight project control methods to understand how I'm supposed to go execute my access or scaffold or insulation or whatever it may be that I'm contracted to do. That obviously cascades up and down, right? If I'm a piping fabricator, the same dynamic would exist for them. They're providing piping spools for three GCs on a major project. Three GCs have a different project control documentation methodology, three have a different materials management methodology, have a different contracting framework. All of those dynamics start to matter. So the traditional way of mitigating risk through purely a contract, I think you're actually installing risk is sort of my problem. You're, you're limiting the ability of the providers on the job site to be aligned, <clears throat> excuse me, to be aligned and to actually communicate and work well together. So this compartmentalization 
You know, it covers all three phases, the engineering, the procurement, materials management, the C-Box folks have a great story, right? I'm a simple soft craft guy. Bag and tag, what a neat concept for insulation. Free kit for scaffold, what a neat concept. Hey, free kit for work packages, IWPs, what, a, what an even neater concept, right? So some of that kind of stuff needs to be thought through. And then when we get to the field, some of the things I heard from uh, the PPI folks, it really does make sense. They're saying the same thing that I think a lot of us are saying. They're saying, I can go in and have a great um, productivity index on a project for my service, and I can still be behind on the project because everyone's in that side of it, managing their own contract execution, but not really managing that capacity of what needs to be built in what order and how fat, you know, in, in that path of construction model. So the, the, the thing that seems so simple to me is an owner group was funded to build a project. They have an FID, they have this model start and navigate by. The first thing out of the gate is the commercial strategy should set this up to say, this is how we're all gonna work together and be able to achieve that start and navigate by. I think we rely on traditional organizations within our, or functions within our organization, how they've always done it. So it's neat to see Shell bringing contracts folks, procurement folks, project control folks, logistics folks, all of those people have to understand this model so that it works. Um, the, the boardroom perspective of FID has to get translated to the field and through that contract. So, a, a little more traditional look at that would be, I think, I think we all know why AWP exists, why I've been attracted to AWP was, it's sort of like that chaos model. How many engineering firms are involved? How many procurement teams and contracts are written? How many contractors are out there actually doing the work? And pretty soon those lines of communication become so chaotic that how can we ever stay on the same page about what's the priority What's the path of construction? Who's on first? Who's on second? I think the beautiful thing about AWT, it's not the end all to everything of how we go execute our work at the tool, but it is a framework to say, this is a common language, a common process. This is how we can establish data standards for the project. And now the piece that I've been kind of pushing for and hearing a lot more in the last couple of years is, this is how a contract and commercial strategy enables us to all be team members on the same team. So pretty simple. Um, just, just sort of a quick illustration. When you, when you look at FID, here's all the pieces of the puzzle. This is where all the hours and dollars are spent. Here's our commercial strategy. Here's how we're going to go and write contracts and put all the pieces together. And then sort of what I see is sort of not only do we, do we kind of change it, but then we start slicing that contract model up and we end up with 20, 30, 40 contracts and that communication chaos starts to happen. The unalignment starts to happen about what's a data standard, never heard that term. What's AWP, don't know. This helps us kind of teach people. So I've learned a lot here and I, I think uh, it, over the last eight, nine years we've been involved. Um, and I think if you start introducing this to your providers, they'll learn a lot too and they'll get excited. I've been very excited about AWP because it helps solve a lot of the problems that we can't solve on our own. <clears throat> so again, just to kind of kind of beat the drum, I think AWP is the perfect framework to help us get there. So if you, if you think about it, back to that one-step math problem, nothing is a one-step math problem anymore. It's really been 15 years, and I want to try and sum it up in my simple perspective, but I think everyone recognized that we needed, needed a better way than every man for himself or every person for themselves on how we go execute a project. So there was a compelling need. I think the, the, the first thing that, that, that people jumped to was, I'm going to buy an AWP, quote-unquote, AWP system. And 10 years ago, that was, wow, I can track an ISO. I can see that ISO number in a model. This is the answer. This is, this is it. It's all about software and a 3D system. Well, that's part of it. But, you know, the next piece was, hey, well, the team in the project trailer all understand AWP, but what about 
Sally in contracts and Mike in logistics and, and Bill in uh, you know, some technical engineering uh, area. How do we get them all to understand that they should engineer this first, they need to order this equipment first, because they want to build this first. So education and training, much like we see with Robin's group at AWP University, critical that everybody on the team understands what AWP means. It's not traditional construction methodology. And then <clears throat> sort of the last piece is, okay, now we all want to work together, but our numbers don't look the same. I have a dash and all my ISO numbers and they don't have a dash in their numbers. What data should we track? What data is not really important? How do we line that up and build data standards? So um, we had a really neat presentation here a couple years ago, um, our webinar with some of the Shell team out of the Hay uh, on data standards and CFOS. You're seeing, uh, you're gonna see Mark talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. It's gonna be awesome. And then the last piece is really the one I've kind of been beating the drum on is commercial strategy. So engagement and alignment. You can't, you can't offload AWP to a group of contractors. You have, to, you have to lead them. Mark's analogy on the slide is perfect. You have to lead them and, and get us there. So last but not least, right, back to the eggs. So all eggs are uniform in size and shape. Uh, all, all eggs arrive in packaging. Uh, all eggs arrive at the same time or on time in her case for AWP. And then all eggs are intact and safe. That's also a big important thing in our industry. Um, they, they meet quality standards. All eggs are dependent on each other for ultimately being delivered to the consumer. So the wrap up for me is AWP is a, a framework for common language, data standards, and now commercial strategies about how we go do AWP. It's not one job to the next job. It's almost a program mindset. You have to take that program mindset and keep those, those key pieces from project to project. It drives alignment and standards for all of us. You're teaching us. We want to be good providers to our owner population. But we need your help and you need our help. So keep teaching us to do that. And then uh, think about it in terms of delivery. We're trying to help deliver a job instead of just manage our contract. And ultimately, AWP is a team sport. So thank you very much. Good day, everybody. My name is Mark Meta with Hexagon, supporting the Acastrut line of product. Um, and today we're going to talk about the ADP data requirements. So we're talking about creating an environment for success. How do we set things up from the beginning and to make things work and to be successful in our ADP projects? So our agenda is going to be five parts here. Uh, why do we need the data requirements? What's the purpose of it? Why do we need them? Where can you find the data requirements? That's kind of important. If you want to use them, you got to know where to find them, right? What do I do with the data requirements? We get asked that a lot when we first released them. A lot of people came back to us and said, hey, okay, how do we use them now? Um, what is behind the data requirements? This is exciting. So we're going to talk about something we've been working on that's going to be released soon. And, that, and then after you hear all that, Everyone will be dying to find out. How can you find out more, of course? So we'll get into that as well. So why do we need to focus on the data requirements? And that's going to be consistency and communication. So a big part of success with anything is going to be communication. We have uh, a lot of meetings and discussions, and uh, we have, so that's a verbal communication. But to communicate across a project, we can't just have verbal communication. We need to have data that's flowing back and forth. So a big, per, a big part of the ADP data requirements is going to be consistency and communication. Um, there is a ADP uh, companion document for the data requirements. And the effort to create that document was actually led by Lloyd Rankin, who runs this conference as well. So we're going to talk about that but from the ADP data requirements companion document. Um, can't we all just get along? And apparently not all of us, right? So we need alignment between stakeholders. 
And on a project, you have a whole lot of stakeholders. You have an owner, an EPC, maybe multiple EPCs, subcontractors, suppliers, all those subcontractors have their suppliers. And then you have a lot of people where it's just looking out for themselves and trying to make money, which is fine. We all want to make money, but we want to have some alignment across all those stakeholders as well. So the ADP data requirements can help us create that alignment between the stakeholders who all have different purposes and different goals they're trying to achieve. Risk. So what we've seen happen is that some sort of requirement has been into a contract to a supplier or subcontractor. Uh, when it comes time to collect that information from them, they have difficulties doing that. And that's the sort of risk we're talking about. So we can cut back on the, the, that sort of risk. Transparency. So on projects, if we're doing a TNM project with the client versus a lump sum project, there's this concept that we'll give more information on a TNM project than a lump sum project. A question has been asked before, a very important question is that how does the ADP process change between TNM versus lump sum? And the answer is it shouldn't. So whether we're doing TNM or lump sum, we can use the data requirements to transfer information, keep it consistent, whether it's uh, regardless of the contract constraint. Proactive planning. So this is always very important. I like to be proactive and get things done, think ahead. Uh, I sent these slides three times to Lloyd just to make sure he got them. So yes, proactive planning. We can do that across the state. Artificial intelligence. So this is the big hot topic. I'm on research team 391, which is artificial intelligence for advanced work packaging. And we're going to be talking about that uh, later this morning, actually, in this room. But one of the first things that we saw from all this is going to be, uh, it's not to get the artificial intelligence to work in the first place, all over our research that we've done interviews and surveys for was just getting clean data in the first place. So in order to make artificial intelligence work, we need to have clean data. Clean data, what does that mean? It means consistency and format and frequency, and our ADP data requirements can help us with that process. Database decision making. So uh, there was a, a funny story when I was with EPCs that someone said, well, what is artificial intelligence going to do for us? And someone said it could be like, you know, you're at a you know, meeting, a scheduled meeting or something, and there's the old guy in the back of the room and says, looks up at the, at the screen and says, something just doesn't look quite right about that. And that's what artificial intelligence could do for us instead of having to rely on someone with that much experience, which we need. We need to continue with that. But we want to have artificial intelligence help us to find things that could go wrong. So uh, we can make decisions based on uh, information, based on data more effectively, as opposed to having to rely on someone in the back of the room speaking up and saying, hey, something just doesn't look quite right. Where can you find the data requirements? Very important. This is something that Ted was uh, uh, led. He, uh, Ted Weitzman led the ADP data requirements group initially. So a lot of this we owe to him. Uh, but one of the part with CII, either your entire company is a member or you're not a member. If you're a member, then you have access to all the research. It is a lot of research. The website is very well organized and it's easy to find it. However, if you're not a member, then uh, we actually decided we, again, led by Ted Weitzman uh, with Warley, uh, to make them available outside the firewall. So anyone can get to the ADP data requirements. You can just do a search for them and they'll show up for you. So the reason why we do this is because we encourage usage across all the stakeholders. We want everyone to get some to, to we see this as a value to the industry. We know that people can get good use out of them. So this is one of the, the research topics and one of the, the documents, some of the documentation we have that's actually available to everyone. You, you can just do a search on it uh, in Google. I've done it myself, so I know it's easy to get to. And a big part of this is that is, so <clears throat> I have a fun job. I enjoy what I do a lot, and it's fun taking stuff from one database to another and coloring up the model and things like that. I enjoy doing it a lot. So say, for example, I'll get on a project and someone will say to me, hey, I saw you color code the model of progress. I want you to do that for me as well. So all right, give me the data, we'll create an interface and read it in. That's just one simple example. But 
the advantage of the data requirements is we could cut back on, okay, I'll write an interface and write and read that in. It's very easy to do if we have clean data, but we could cut back on having a clean data in the first place and also create those interfaces as well. What do you do with the data requirements? So the same thing we talked about before, very important in some of the different aspects of life, especially in industrial construction, is commun simple communication. So uh, that communication is not just within one company, but across all the stakeholders in the project. So a big part of this is going to be also a repeatable process. So one of the things we've talked about in some of these presentations is that uh, what happens is we'll get on a project and we'll make things work. We have difficulties, we find solutions, then we get to the next project and sometimes it seems like we have to create the whole thing over again. So what we can do is to help facilitate a repeatable process is actually to use the data requirements and that way we know what we're going to get project after project. And one of the things we talked about quite a bit is to put the data requirements into contracts. Uh, we're not going to have construction workers writing contract language. That's for the, for the contracts or subcontracts department to do. However, we can put the data requirements into contracts just as data and not so much as a, uh, 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 we wouldn't be writing the text for the contract, just put them in, it, in the contract as a requirement. One of the things that's very important about this entire process, when you have, when you, if you want to implement advanced sort of packaging at your company, I tend to think about things in terms of EPC because that's my background, but whether with an owner and subcontractors and suppliers, technology providers, it's important to, especially in EPC, I would say, but it's important to have a, a, an ADP champion. So to do all those process, to create, to communicate, repeatable process, putting contracts and such, and to make this a successful process, it's important to have an ADP champion that has some accountability and responsibility. And that way we know what we're gonna get project after project. So one of the neat things that we can do about this is that say, for example, and this, this happens sometimes, you're on a project and you replace the system, you replace your material management system or project control system. If you use the data requirements, then regardless of the system, you're gonna get the same information. The thing is, is that most material management systems think the same way. Most document control, control systems think the same way but the reports that you get out of those are gonna be a little bit different. So by using the ADP data requirements, we can have some standardization and we know what we're gonna get project after project. Sometimes construction can be like a box of chocolates, you never know what you're gonna get. What is behind the data requirements? So this is very exciting for us. We have been working on something called a, a, a data model. And I use the term we somewhat lightly, I'm involved in it but it's led by uh, Eric Deshaw of Shell and Mick Hayachi of JDC. Mick, uh, there's Mr. Mick in the back there. So the effort is led by these two, but we have several other people who prove, answer questions for those gentlemen. But, and it's a data model, not a 3D model, and it is quite complex. I'm somewhat of a data nerd, I'm a computer nerd at construction, but it's, it, the data model is not an easy model to understand. But uh, fortunately, we have expertise in this area working with construction, working with ADP. As we build this data model, we do it literally with CFOS open. So as we're doing some of these meetings, we have CFOS open. So we actually have to so create alignment with the CFOS standard. So it stands for your capital facilities, information handover specification. It's one of the most commonly used specifications. And as the name indicates, what it's largely used for is turning over from uh, an EPC to an owner, what information is required. The ADP data requirements have some overlap information, so we want to make sure we have alignment with that. So as we build this data model, we're doing it with CFOS in mind and literally have CFOS open as well. And why should you care, right? We, why does it matter to you? Uh, we split this out into four parts, and with owners, what you're going to get is a uh, a data standard that's aligned with CFOS, so you don't have competing standards, you don't have to have multiple standards that you expect people to, to follow. You have something that's going to have an al alignment with CFOS that already exists now. And then with contractors, uh, again, my background is EPC, so I think about with, our, with clients that we work with, 
they all want a little bit different information, but also when we work with subcontractors, we ask them for information, give them, okay, give me your progress or, or uh, uh, material management information, and all those reports are gonna be a little bit different. So using the ABP data requirements helps us get some standardization from the EPC to the owners, but also the EPCs to the subcontractors as well. Suppliers, this is a really good one. So as a, an EPC, I've been on projects where we make requirements for, sub, for suppliers to give us information. So one of the things that we beat up suppliers about isn't so much getting it faster, it's you actually getting, getting us data. So I feel bad for some of the suppliers because they're not set up for that sort of data requirement uh, handover. So what we can do with the ABP data requirements is to give them a standard that they know what's going to be expected out of them project after project, because some suppliers aren't just set up with databases to pull that information. And then another part of the, about the suppliers that we've discussed is that by using ABP data requirements, it gives them a little bit of insight into the project to help them support the project a little bit better. And technology providers. So being a technology provider is a very fun thing to do. I enjoy doing it a lot. And like we said, is that we create interfaces where we could cut back. One of the things that we could do is that if you have a project system with ADP day requirements in them, then if you replace that system with another one, then you're going to have more of a plug and play atmosphere. I can't guarantee everything's going to be plug and play, but we're, we're moving towards that. We're working closer to a plug and play environment. And how can you find out more? How much would you pay for all this? Well, don't answer yet, because you also get the ADP data uh, requirements companion document. So uh, in the companion document, it talks about what the requirements are, what aren't they, and why should you care? Uh, it talks about which data requirements are going to be important for uh, different phases of the project. It gives a list of all 60 tables. The data requirements are pretty extensive, so it gives you a high-level overview of them. How are they interpreted? There's a page in the data requirement uh, companion document about uh, how, are, how do you interpret them. It gives you a little bit of text. It gives you, we give you two examples for each one, but also tells you why they're important and why they're required. So that page is very helpful in terms of understanding the data requirements as well. We talked about putting the data requirements into contracts in the companion document. It actually has three pages on uh, how you would put that into how we, you would put the data requirements into contracts. So we have to be very careful. We talked about contracting strategy quite a bit. So it's very important in how we do things and how we make things happen. But uh, so we have to be cognitive of that. So we give you some guidance on that. And we talked about our ADP. Uh, implementation champion, that's not an easy job to do. So we provide some background information about the, you know, we always, always comes up often about the cost of implementing ADP in the first place, but also the benefits we're going to get out of that. So uh, we talk about, we talk about the benefits and the cost of it. So help our ADP uh, uh, implementation champion get their job done and make these things happen in reality. And speaking of making things happen in reality, now we're going to hear from Mr. Nay. Good morning. So uh, this morning I'm going to try and um, answer a couple of questions in terms of the, the data strategy. Um, why is it so critical to a project? Um, why do we need it? And what can go wrong if we don't have it? I'm going to do this by um, giving you a little bit of an insight in how we take that data to market. So we've heard from Jamie um, in, in terms of the team. Uh, we heard from Rick about strategy, and we've heard from Mark about the alignment. Um, so as we move forward, um, Kevin, you might see a couple of slides, uh, graphics here that have been used before in this conference. Um, data is not just data. It's the glue, it's the commodity that moves us forward. And when you think of it as a commodity and you think of it as a, a product that can be developed and moved around, you start to realize what it can do for you. 
So, of course, we look at this in, in where does it come from, where does it go? And there's two main aspects here. There's the data publishers, and there's the data consumers. Our challenge is to transition that data from one to the other, make sense of it, organize it, and allow somebody to actually usefully use the back end of it. So why do we actually have data in the first place? There's a business requirement. We produce drawings so that um, engineering can show a, a product to the client. We produce drawings and data so that we can buy the bits and pieces. We can actually uh, construct. And then in the end of it, we can actually use. So quality data comes from a, a holistic view of um, all of the products that you need, not just one isolated view. The fact that data exists on a project is not the same as it being consumable. Understanding how data is currently managed and how it needs to be managed is the key. So in an environment where you're not using a centralized data repository, people are producing data, they're analyzing it and putting it on each and everybody at their own data top, uh, desktop. And so this is a lot of people recreating the same noise over and over again. What we're trying to do is to bring it all into one. So the graphic here is really showing you how all of this raw data is coming out and it's going over to the, uh, the data consumers. This is what it looks like on the, on the back end. What a mess. Reports. Reports galore. Okay. It's amazing how much data the producers can actually produce. Do we need it? No. Do we need some of it? Yes, we do. So how do we filter it? How do we get from what they can actually produce to what we need? Um, to do that, I'm going to steal a phrase from John Fish. Keep the end in mind. And the end in mind is the data consumer. So on every project, it's a little bit different. Every project, it's going to be fit for purpose. The report that we put out has to be useful. It has to be, uh, it has to contain data that we want to read. I don't want to know how much a loaf of bread is if I'm building a plant somewhere. It's useless data. So a $100 million project is probably going to produce anywhere between uh, 50 to 100 effective reports. And that's also including visual reports, 40 reports from models. So again, back to what, what do the consumers actually want? We've had a couple of conversations around here in the last few days, and the, the, the individual who's the end user so if you're a data analyst, you want to be able to see everything. You want to be able to flip it upside down, inside out, look at everything. If you're the foreman, you want a big red button that goes, hey, look at my IWP. I don't want to have to dig through everything to be able to get to that point. So it's going to be useful in the hands of the person looking at it. So the key is, right at the beginning, is a, uh, on a one-to-one -one relationship, having a common denominator. And the common denominator sits in the model, and you're able to extract that, take it out, and use it in any number of sort of formats for the end result, which is the, uh, 
the report. I've got a, uh, my notes here, and I've got this huge must be written. And the reports, they all tell you a unique story, but they must be reviewed. It's not AI. You've actually got to look at the report, make sense of it, and then use it. So the key to cleaning up a mess is to develop a model of how the data will be formatted and scheduled for delivery. So to do that, we look at a centralized data repository, which is where the data is conditioned. Uh, it goes from the raw state. We go through the process of uh, understanding who needs to look at it on the back end. And that successful uh, strategy using the data, it, it can come from a centralized data warehouse, but the centralized data warehouse provides you an opportunity for one source of truth. Don't go to 15 different filing cabinets to get the same data from the same drawing. How's it all in one spot? The data, if it's one-to-one, -one, can all be linked from the one central place. The engineer doesn't need his own copy. The constructor doesn't need his own copy. That one drawing will suffice everybody if they open up the cabinet and look at the same drawing. So this area um, within the warehouse, it's where the magic happens. It's not where it magically flows across. There's actually a huge piece of work that has to take place in taking that raw information and changing it into a usable format. So um, the skill set to migrate the, the data to the publisher, the end user, has got to be in a way that's fit for purpose. Like I've said this a little bit earlier, it's got to be the end user in mind. So, you know, that's, that's where we sort of introduce in sourcing. Are we really in the business of data? Or are we in the business of patch chemical plants, making money? Who's the right people to look after this data for you? So I know uh, Jeff's going to be doing a presentation later on today about insourcing. I encourage you to take, uh, take that in. The last thing here I have is the effect of a good strategy or not having a good strategy. Well, it's really boiled down to um, which path do you want your constructor to walk? The better the data strategy, the easier it is on the back end to use the information. I will close though with data is not going to make your project any better than it currently is. What it is going to do is going to provide the project managers and their teams with an opportunity to make informed decisions so that they can steer the ship in the right direction. So with that, I'll give it back to Jamie. Great. Thank you. Okay, so that's, that's the slides. Uh, you know, I'll summarize real quickly. Um, you know, dirty little secret, we didn't uh, necessarily collaborate in developing these, so I was pleased to see the words communication and alignment, and, and frankly, that the data underpins it, you know, throughout. So either uh, great minds think like or bald minds think like. So, <laughs> so uh, but with that, we got about 10 minutes. Uh, one, <laughs> uh, we got about 10 minutes to, to open it up for questions. and. Uh, Good way.
<laughs> so good that there's no question. My name is Jeff Ackerman. Can you guys hear me? Right? My name is Jeff Ackerman. Um, so, very familiar with CFES and the work that's gone on and very supportive. I guess my question is a data specification put in a contract is a condition for success, but it doesn't guarantee success. Can you guys talk a little bit around data quality visualization as a way of kind of helping ensure the outcomes? Because I think sometimes we kind of focus on the front end and we don't put an equal into making sure that we're actually getting the you know, the information that we need and the timeliness that we need to enable the processes or the business outcomes. And so, you know, I, I worry a little bit sometimes on, you know, I used to tell my team all the time, the CIFA standards or the CII standards are great, but until we've actually embedded them, let's stop and let's make sure that we're actually getting the outcomes before we can move on to the next standard or standard state. So part of your comments was with re relation to guarantee success, and another part was also for what do we do with the data and how do we visualize that? So obviously, there's no guarantee for success. Just because you do use the data requirements doesn't guarantee success. So one of the things that I had mentioned is like using, getting, moving towards a plug and play environment. And I said that it doesn't guarantee you can just pick up one and drop the other one in, but it helps us move us towards that direction. So the MVP data requirements can help us with that. And then also with visualizations, that's one of the things I do with my career when I was with the EPCs and now with the technology provider is to take that information and visualize it. And like I said, is that we, you know, I used the example of project controls. The concept of a project control, EVMS, or value management system, they all think the same way, but you're also going to get a little bit different reports. So we can use, we can, the data requirements will help us visualize that information to cut back on creating interfaces as well. And then for pulling all that information together, that's one of the things that Nick's team does quite a bit, and that is uh, with uh, their, their data warehouse as well. Do you want to comment on that? So um, without the standards, we, we obviously have to look at what is important to extract. Um, fifth purpose is the key. But we have to go through some standard documents from engineering, who's providing what and when. Yeah, I think we heard it in a presentation yesterday, is, is that standard out there? No, it's not. Uh, do we have our, our own that we use and that we're developing? Yes, we do. So we, we go in to, and we have a list of documents that is gonna provide us certain data, certain key items. Uh, we extract data from different aspects, things like your pyramid cycle, things that are going to link together on an AWP process. Uh, certain critical documents from engineering, their frequency, not just, hey, they're now delivered to us as a deliverable. We like to see them biweekly during the development because they're going to give us information throughout project to be able to make decisions. Did I answer that for you? Yeah, in, in the end, you know, I think for everybody here, we think about AWP, we think about data specifications and data standards. I think it's a journey, right? My worry is sometimes that the effort that it actually takes to get to the outcome is underestimated. So putting something into a contract for data specification, I think some organizations check the box. But there's a hell of a lot more work in execute to actually track the data is actually coming through to the quality needed to enable the processes and outcomes that the business needs. Well, so and, we, and we don't budget for that. We don't resource for that. We don't recognize it as a success factor that's required. I think that's true with AWP in general. So much goes into the front end and we put so little into the actual execute part of tracking the outcomes. 
right? The journey's just begun. It's not finished. And so my encouragement to people when they think about data is think about data, the effort it's going to take to actually get to the outcomes and resource for that, for that success. Because I don't think this does 100% the justice, and I'm not being critical. I think it's absolutely required to get there, but I, I just try to make sure that people recognize how much more is actually needed because the software is only as good as the data, right? And, and I think that's the learning, and that's why people are struggling, is if you have software with untrusted data, you don't get usage, and you get disappointment, you don't get outcomes. I would add to that that even bad data tells a story, and you have to listen to it. You have to be able to recognize what the story is, and it also takes that effort. Yeah, I, I got a question kind of in the same line of the, the previous uh, question. I want to play devil's advocate a little bit. My name is uh, Jean-Luc Brombard, so I worked with uh, Kevin Nally on the, on the same project. And five years ago, I didn't know what AWP was, and it's been, a, like Kevin explained yesterday, it's been a very long and tough uh, journey. Um, I also didn't realize how important data is for a project. I didn't, I didn't grasp the amount of data. I didn't realize that you need a standard, you need a structure, you need an architecture in place. Um, but we got a long way to convince the industry that AWP is, is the way to go. Even in my own uh, company, uh, there are still a lot of people that are not convinced that AWP is, is the way to go. And, and in, in my new role, I uh, have been a little bit involved with uh, the C4 standard. And uh, again, I'm a construction guy, I'm not a data guy, but it seems like there is a big disconnect here. It seems like, I mean, my understanding is that CFOS is not a standard for project execution, it's more for uh, plants and operation. And I feel like it's, it's a bridge too far. I think uh, we still have a lot of work to do to convince the industry to implement AWP, and to me, I don't understand the C4 standard. I don't recognize any other terminology, and I'm really concerned that it's a bridge too far. So, any comments on that uh, provocative statement? Uh, first thing, it it's, again boils down to fit, fit for purpose. Um, are we going to bring one rule, one set of standards to AWP? No. We're going to bring a uh, a whole host of standards to be utilized and then the fifth purpose for each project. We're trying to get to the end goal. So if you look at the journey that we've had in the last five years, we have changed the model of how we actually get to the end point. And if you go way back, it started with workplace planning. AWP wasn't part of it. The, the thought of actually having the engineers engaged. So when you sort of move that forward in time, um, I can't talk to the SQL part of it, but I can tell you that the model for a $100 million job is not the model for the billion dollar job. You have to take in portion, in proportion, to get what you need out of it to get to the same end result. Yeah. So it's not easy to pull all that information together. When I first looked at the data requirements, that's one of the comments that I had up front was that it's a lot. So one of the things that I did do when I first got involved with the group was to go through them all and change several of them from uh, required to optional. And then we had a review session so we could agree or disagree uh, or, or change them or not change them. So it's not easy to pull that information. I made that a similar comment myself when I first saw that. And uh, the response is that we're going to need a lot of that information. We're going to need that information. So it's not easy to pull that information together. But we're talking about data. We're talking about communication. And that's a big part of making projects successful. So it's not easy to do it. However, we're going to need a lot of that information, regardless one way or the other. Another part of it that Nick touched on is that if you feel that it is too much, it's going to be a bit much to pull. We're providing a starting place for you. 
So it's not really a standard that you have to follow. We actually don't, we call it the ADP data requirements. So it's not like a spec that you have to follow word for word. We'll provide a starting point for you for you to use as well. So uh, one more question. It's not so much a question. Um, I worked on the Exxon project as well. It's more of a lesson learned. And it's, to me, it's about securing the information or the data too. As we, as we start getting the information back from the field, I, f I found in my experiences that if, if the top comes down with the club saying, not doing good, he starts hitting on my construction manager. My construction manager hits the superintendent, goes to the GF, and here I am. I'm going to make that data right, no matter how it, how it is. It's going to come back. And it just brings uh, manipulated data. And so it goes back up to the top, and they can't make proper decisions or, or good decisions for the project. So I just some emphasis on the securing of the data. Thanks. So if I can address that, um, data is not always going to tell you a good story. And one of the things that data in a real world, in a, uh, a data warehouse environment, is going to tell you data in front of you that you didn't normally have until two weeks later. So in the project environment, it tended to be swept under and made to look pretty. This is not going to give you that. It's going to give you real data that the bar is going to swing right and left in a day. It's going to say, oh my God, we're in trouble. Hey, we're doing great. If the people reading this data don't understand that, they're going to react in the wrong way. You're going to get the wrong message sent down through the chain. Um, there's a lot of work to do in terms of understanding what those swings are. And is it really something that everybody has to jump the uh, change? Or is it something that, hey, don't worry about it. Um, this is coming down the line. It'll actually change for us. You're right, it's, it's how people react, and you tend to hide things. Data in this environment exposes it. This is really, it's not your dirty laundry, it's reality. But reality gives us our best ability to move forward. <laughs>